Discover South Carolina presents The Palmetto Porch, a podcast featuring some of the most uniquely charming destinations across the Palmetto State. I'm Devin Whitmire. Join me as I find out what's off the beaten path as I speak to South Carolina locals who know their towns best. Find The Palmetto Porch wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information about our show, visit scpalmettoporch.com. Everyone loves TV Dad. On the next TV Dad, presented by Progressive, TV Dad gets us through heartache. (laughs) Chin up, sport. Oh, hey, TV Dad. You know what heals all wounds? Time? (laughs) No, it's remembering the drivers who switch and save with Progressive could save hundreds. But Jen still doesn't want to be with me. (gasps) True. I actually saw her with your friend Brian earlier. Wait, what? Listen to your TV dad. Drivers who switch and save with Progressive could save hundreds. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates. Potential savings will vary. If tales of ghostly hauntings, Bigfoot encounters, extraterrestrial interactions, and cosmic awakenings are your cup of tea, join me, your host, Eric Salagi. For uncomfortable podcast every Tuesday at 10 a.m. And as always, stay uncomfortable, my friends. Hey guys, I'm Jerry. And I'm Tracy. And we are Hillbilly, Hillbilly Horror, Horror Stories. Stories. I'm Justin. And I'm Jay. And we are Cryptids, Cryptids of, of the, the Corn, Corn Podcast. Podcast. We are excited to be doing a live event with Hillbilly Horror Stories at Post Town Elementary, a school located in Middletown, Ohio in the Cincinnati Dayton area. Post Town has been known as one of the most haunted schools in the world for decades now. In fact, their slogan is, when you leave here, you believe. The event is Saturday, April 22nd from 6 p.m. till 10 p.m. inside the haunted school. Wait, we're going to be in a haunted school at night? Uh, yeah, that's our best chance of seeing ghosts. But there's only 50 tickets available and priced at only $30. They're going to go fast. Your tickets get you to a live podcast by both Hillbilly Horror Stories and Crimson of the Corn, as well as the ability to roam around one of the most haunted locations in Ohio. So get your tickets today at hillbillyhorrorstories.com. There'd be a lot of poop in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing a six-foot alligator go swinging through the air and slam into a tree. These guys are the scientists of the supernatural, lecturers leaving lessons for inquiring laymen. They are applying the scientific method to a world that baffles science. They are the cryptids of the corn. But who else has big black wings and red eyes? Um, Batman. Oh, Mothman. Oh yeah, Mothman. A great white shark was stolen. Oh, someone stole a shark? I got stuff for you you don't even know about. She's a witch. She turned me into a newt. Who knows? Anything could be possible. Anything could be possible. It's really big. Mm -hmm. Abduction vibes. Holy moly. It sounds like you were abducted. And it just stood up. I mean, it just like kept going and going. And she goes, what the... Hello, hello, and welcome back to Crips of the Corn Podcast. I am the great and powerful Mr. E. And for the night, I've gotten rid of Jay. But don't worry, I've upgraded dramatically. I only say that because he's not here. Uh, but so the one problem, though, with not having Jay is Jay does all the guest introductions. So this is the part I don't like because I always mess up reading. But I know these guys pretty well, so I know they'll forgive me. But... uh they're famous for doing a special intro for everybody they have on. So me and Jay racked our brains and wrote one for them, just to kind of return the favor. These guys are the archaeologists of Appalachia, the hunters of Hollerhaints. They are searching for the silver lining in every nook and cranny of those hills. They are Appalachian Intelligence. And Justin Ryan, thank you for being here. Woo! Yeah, that Dude. was excellent. I'm glad you that liked was it. Great. Awesome. We racked our brain all week on that for three lines. Well, man, I gotta say, that's one of the main reasons that we try to come up with these awesome intros is so that when we go on other people's shows, they're like, 
hey, we got to come up with a really cool <laughs> intro. So then we feel a little better about ourselves when it's all over. It's just, yeah. it's just a circle, just a very happy, go. loving circle. I mean, you did it for us, and it made it into our new intro. Yeah, yeah. I've got to admit, I rather enjoy every episode of Cryptids of the Corn <laughs> hearing my voice to start it off. Yeah. I didn't even tell I you. I was just say, I'm looking across the room at the guy while I'm listening to it. I'm like, man, I can hear this at any time. <laughs> but thank you guys for coming on. And we are missing Lance, just like we're missing Jay. Yeah. Uh, stuff, life happens, that kind of stuff. You know, it's just the podcaster's life, trying to, especially with. Well, it would be five people tonight trying to get five people's schedules lined up. Yeah, that's tough. You know, it's just, it doesn't happen very often. But I do great, greatly appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. We are, man. Oh, yeah. We are. We we appreciate you inviting us on. You know, we had a we had a blast, and we're extremely grateful that you and Jay came on our show uh, a couple months back, whatever it was. We had a really, really good time then. It was a great conversation. So, you know, we... We love the uh, the invites come on here, and it's our pleasure to be on here talking with you tonight on uh, on your show, man. We're excited about it. Now, could you guys please go through and plug all your stuff and just make sure everybody knows where to find you, you know, uh, Patreon, all that extra goodness? Uh, yeah, you can check us out on any podcast or wherever you listen to your podcast. We're on all the major platforms. You, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel at Appalachian Intelligence. You can jump over and hang out with us on the Discord. You can follow us on all of our social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, mainly Instagram. That's where we're at. we hang out more than anything. Um, you can jump over and check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Appalachian underscore intelligence. Uh, but mainly just come over, check us out, and join that Hill Folk community because we just love we love to build the tribe like we, like we say all the time. So... Uh, Ryan, did you have anything to add before I start talking? Being a bad host? No, you you were not being a bad host. That's you were doing your job. That's fine. We actually Justin. Were... He, Justin does everything. <laughs> That's like when I, it comes to that. It's just a Justin so, thing. Yeah, I'm yeah. giving him his props. Yeah, man. that's a Justin thing, and uh, well, he handles all that. Like I'm trying now to learn more, so I'm not such a bad co-host. <laughs> No, it's the dynamic. Yeah. 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 It, it is. Like, I can do all that because what you bring to the table with your quippy one-liners and your gummy usage, that makes up for everything else. Well, that's not going to stop. So, so are, you back, are you back on the gummies now? I know you were off them for a bit. Now we're back, right? We're back. Okay. I thought so, but I wanted to make sure. Yes. So... Uh, we don't normally talk like this. No, it's or look like this. So I won't. I won't name names, but somebody that often comes into this studio, like three times a week, took way too many, and became a puddle of jelly, and we had to get rid of all the audio for three hours. Oh wow! Because it was pretty much just me talking and them going, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, any more thoughts? No, staring well, see, at those that's fish. Why we have that's why we have a lance. Yeah. So yeah. for nights when Ryan's like that, it's just me and Lance, and you know, <laughs> yes, usually, but see, when it's just us. See, I like to experiment with things, and sometimes those go wrong. And <laughs> that's what experiments for, right? Yeah. Like I learned, I can't blend a sativa blend with my other regular gummies just to see what it's like to mix them <laughs> because your face goes numb and it's hard to talk right your face goes numb the eyes start drifting apart it's yeah. nuts so we haven't had the pleasure of drinking in person together but when I you can tell when I start hitting that point of tipping because I have a yeah. slightly lazy eye <laughs> and he checks out early so I start <laughs> looking like a big mouth bass. That. Just they start looking different ways. I'd go full chameleon. I think we're losing Justin. Yeah, that's it's the best. It's the fastest way to tell. But you guys are amazing. But you're from Central Appalachia. Uh, Ohio is kind of a weird state because we're Appalachia, quote unquote, and we're Midwest, quote unquote. But we don't really feel like either. 
yeah. because you know our our hills are not hills, even some of the big ones. And then we where I'm from is pretty Midwesty, but I'm literally in the the very corner of Ohio up by Michigan, so it's just corn. Uh, but yeah, you guys mm-hmm. building a tribe. You do your powwows. I just listened to that episode. I love that. Uh, Eric from Uncomfortable just did something similar too, and that was a. Re- they're, they're fun episodes having your listeners, your you know your fan friend base come on and just kind of talk and have fun. So I advise everybody at home to check that out because you get personal stories and stuff like that you don't get to hear. Yeah, for sure. You know that's something that we wanted to do. You know from early, early, early on was, you know, when we really started building this community, we want everybody to be a a member and a a working partner in what we do with Appalachian Intelligence. You know, it's, yeah, obviously it's us coming on here and setting things up and and doing all the behind the scenes work for it. But I mean, if, if it's just us all the time, it's the same old theories and the same old guys talking the same old things. And, yeah, we're going to have a good time regardless. You know, I, we always tell people, even if you think the show sucks, you know, just come check us out based on personality wise. <laughs> I mean, yeah. You'll get enough there. But it was something that we really wanted to do early on was to, to build the tribe. And we're not just talking. I mean, yeah, obviously, with other content creators and, and other podcasters and you know, filmmakers and all these different things, you know, that people that are operating in the, in the weird realm, but it's, it's the listeners too, man. It's, it's the audience that's out there because I know when I was just a a podcast fan, before I started podcasting, there would be a hundred times that I would be listening to an episode thinking, Oh man, you know, I really wish that I had the opportunity to say this. So that's why we eventually started a podcast because I really wanted the opportunity to say these things. So we want, we want to be able to let that go on with the, with, a, with the Hill folk, you know, with the audience out there, we want to bring them in, allow them to, to share their theories and things that they're working on and their experiences and to just make a comfortable community for everybody to come together and just chop it up about the weird or life or you know, struggle or whatever, you know, it doesn't matter just to, to build this, this big community and have a good time with it. Well, I think you guys are knocking that out of the park. Uh, what? So wait, King of the Hill folk, we were going to try to get into that intro, but we couldn't make it <laughs> kind of get into that scheme. Uh, cause you guys are, uh, you guys got a great community, like a real loving community, which is awesome. You know, it's, I think a lot of, podcasts that kind of reach our levels kind of forget that without the without those people i mean what do we do it's nothing yeah yeah it, you know it's the listeners are i i, I try to do like once every couple of weeks i post something like thank you guys you know it's all for you because like we're very blessed we're getting ready to move into an actual studio here That's at the end awesome. of summer we got a big space a 30 by 35 building parking lot all that stuff so we're moving into that and that's all because the listeners yeah. Otherwise, we'd just be two drunks talking at each other. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of the same thing that you guys are doing with like your your coffee in the mornings, your Mm -hmm. your cryptic coffee in the morning that you do, and your your trivia nights, and all the stuff that you guys do with with your community through Patreon and all this different stuff. I mean, it's the same kind of thing. You know, it's it's recognizing that we wouldn't be where we are, how small that that may be if it wasn't for the community out there, if it wasn't for the Hill folk, you know, sharing the show and coming on and content and then pushing it and, you know, giving us these uh, ideas and, and opinions and, and criticism where it's needed, you know, constructive criticism, like, you know, we wouldn't be, there's, there's a select few, I would call them tribal elders in the, in the Hill folk tribe that really, man, they carry a lot of stuff like, like discord, we wouldn't even have to jump in anymore. And there's a few people in there that would just carry that and keep it going. They might as well be administrators. <laughs> um, you know, even the same thing with the powwow. I mean, if you listen to our last powwow episode that we did, and, and we do like a, a, usually within the last couple of weeks of the month, that's what we do. We'll send out a mass invite for a certain tier of, of people on Patreon. And, you know, we all have a big, a big powwow. We just come in and, but it would be the same thing with that. Like, even if we just came on and 
done like a little intro and said, Hey, what's up everybody? Sorry, but we got a jam. I would feel totally comfortable with pushing record and just letting it go. And it being great content because what I've learned is a lot of the listeners out there are way, way, way smarter than any of these boys in the or, Appalachian or, intelligence. Or us. <laughs> no, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm talking us. about. It's us. And you know, the discord turned out to be exactly what I was hoping it would be. And I love the discord channel and everybody we have on there, you know, it's so much fun. You know, you'll just see pictures of people's dogs or, Hey, my child's birthday was today or, you know, just, Hey, I made this today and it looks delicious. You know, Oh man. I know you guys have a whole food thing. Yeah. (laughs) What's the name of the guy that's always making stuff? Well, Joel. uh, Yes. Fido is his name. Joel, on there. a.k.a. That's Fido, it. a.k.a. Junkfly, a.k.a. other names that I can't mention. A name oh, yeah. of Junkfly, and he makes such amazing food. Oh, yeah, dude. He's a professional chef. Man, he's, he's, so, chef. he's been doing it so long that now he's in like a supervisory, you know, right. some kind of management role that all he does is sit back and you know, make new menus and, and work on schedules. He only gets in the kitchen every now and then, but when he does, he makes sure to send us some pictures. Well, we'll talk about later, but when you guys find that silver, I know you guys are going to hire him. For sure. Oh, for sure. We're going to have to have somebody cook on the yacht. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Call it a yacht. <laughs> but if you guys are ready, we'll move into some of these uh, topics. As I know... We're going to go for a while. Oh, let's go. Uh, but the yeah. first one is just kind of in general. People don't realize how old Appalachia actually is. Uh, it's argued right now whether Appalachia is one of the oldest or the oldest standing mountain range on the planet. Uh, it's very, very fossil poor. Just due to it was older than almost everything that's been on this planet alive, you know. Uh, but you guys have some heavy insights to that. I love your show because you talk about all this crazy stuff. And there's a theory we're going to get into here in a little bit that I'm super excited for, and you don't even know why. Good. Mm-hmm. Hmm. But yeah, so I guess just kind of talk about how, what, like the specialness of Appalachia. You know, both live there and stuff like that. So we have people all over the world listening. You know, they have the Blue Mountains in Australia. We've had a couple people on from there. And Appalachia, though, I've been to the, I've been to the Rockies. I've been to the Ozarks. But Appalachia just has its own like feeling. It's yeah. a it's a hard thing to explain to somebody. So I'm going to let you guys try to do it because I'm from the Flatlands. <laughs> well, I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head right there with saying that Appalachia has its own feeling, and that feeling that I get is old. Like you can feel it. You can feel the the ancientness. I don't know if that's a word. It is now. It is now. You can feel how ancient the Appalachian Mountains are. You know, I actually heard on an, on an episode today, I heard Tony Merkel make a statement on the confessionals that when he was younger and he walked into the woods as a boy, you know, he felt like he was going into a different realm. Well, I'm 34 years old, and every time that I walk into the woods here, that's how I feel. I mean, because it's just – there's a different energy. There's a different feel, you know, and like you were talking about the age of, you know, and we were talking, you were, you were pop quizzing me a little bit before we started on this thing and I nailed it. Yes, you did. <laughs> but, you know, according to where you look, uh, according to what statistics and what research you look at, people say that the Appalachian mountains range from um, as old as 1.2 billion years old. And, and started beginning as young as 480 million years old, which either one is a really, really, really freaking long time ago. Just like, you know, you were saying then, it's, it's fossil poor. There are a lot of caverns and caves in Appalachia, a lot of like, like the mammoth cave system. There are parts of it that you won't find any fossils at all because the cavern was made and created before anything living was was there so ryan said it perfectly off air uh so you said they're old the appalachian mountains are older than what ryan 
Bones. Older than Bones. People don't realize that. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, we like to, we make the joke sharks are older than trees on here all the time because uh, they are. But yeah. the Appalachian Mountains are older than Bones. Yeah. They're older than Bones, like we were talking before we started. They're older than Saturn's rings. Yeah. So I mean, think about that. Saturn's rings are 200 to 400 million years old. Uh, so at the oldest point, it's still 80 million years younger. So if you put Appalachia at the youngest point and Saturn's ring at the oldest point, it's still 80 million years younger than the mountains. Yeah. 80 million years. <laughs> That's nuts. That's nuts. So, yeah, I mean, you know, just it's this area where we are, you know, it's just you can feel that you can feel that. That ancientness, I'm just going to keep using that of, I, of where we are. I, I think I mean, there that's was, accurate. You know, yeah, I went to school in Appalachia for college and it it feels alive. I mean, literally everything around you is moving. And the kind of the weird stuff, you know, acid mine drainage, I guess you have to do a lot of work with that. And you see these big sides of these hills and mountains that are look like they're bleeding. And you could feel like hurt and pain around it. It's it's weird. It's like the whole mountain range is alive. And it feels it's just it's a hard feeling to tell somebody. And I've been through the Ozarks, I've been a little bit in the Rockies and stuff like that. Uh the Ozarks I love, but the Ozarks don't feel like the Appalachians, you know, they don't been up to some of the mountain ranges in the north, you know, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't feel the same. It's just yeah. a hard thing to put on it, you know. Uh, but yeah, that's it's it's if anybody at home hasn't got the chance, go to Appalachia and not just Pigeon Forge. <laughs> no, you know, Pigeon Forge is pretty much eleven pancake houses and two golf tracks or uh, golf cart yep. tracks. Yep. yep. Good pancakes. Those, pan- those pancake houses close at uh, seven forty-five. So, <laughs> God, it pisses me off. Well, that's the thing, you know people people that want to, people that come to Appalachia, you know that's the places that they hit is these really are these really touristy places. You know your Pigeon Forge in Gatlinburg. You're uh, like Boone and Banner Elk, North Carolina for the skiing, you know, things like that. And, and not taking away anything, you know, not taking from those places. I love those places, but that's not Appalachia. Yeah. Right. Well, like, enjoy you, it while you can, folks, because it's slowly crawling into the sea. <laughs> that is so. true. That is true. Eventually. Was, we were doing some research the other day, and uh, we have this book that a listener sent us, Katie Lakomsky. Thank you, Katie, if you hear this again. Thank you, uh, she sent us a book called Tales of the Caddy Wampus, and it's a bunch of different mythical, you know, creatures and cryptids and entities and all this stuff of West Virginia. And one of the things talked about in there were the moving mountains. And it was given all these native accounts of the natives talked about looking at the Smoky Mountains. You know, we're talking Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg, talking about how they could literally watch the Smoky Mountains moving. Well, through scientific research, it has been found that Smoky Mountains do, in fact, move two hundredths of a centimeter a year. So, I mean, they they should make it back to the Atlantic Ocean about the same time the sun's exploding. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, probably around the same time. So enjoy it while you can. Enjoy it while you can. Moral of the day's story. Don't take anything for granted. <laughs> but uh, one of you guys' episodes, and I, I'm sorry, I should have I should have read it down before. But you guys talked about, or maybe just came up with the idea about things being, whether they're old little G gods, like you guys say, and I, I stole that. I say it all the time now. Uh, these things being punished and being put underneath the coal underneath these old mountain ranges. And, you know, Joel from Kill the Mockingbirds talks about the thing before us, you know, the the world before us. And that could be the things, you know, think about it. If you wanted to punish something and really not want something found, you put a really big mountain range on top and you put a extremely hazardous chemical. Most people don't realize this at home. Uh, When coal is exposed to water, it makes hydrochloric acid and sulfuric acid. Uh, We had one acid mine drainage ditch 
It was pulling out a solid one on the pH. Uh, wow. It was eating our instruments. It was very impressive. Because uh, this is stuff we use to test acid. So it's normally pretty acid resistant. And it started eating the instruments. And we're like, that's probably not the best thing. <laughs> but you, so you guys came up with that idea. I think that's the first time I heard it from a podcast. So I'm going to give you guys the floor to kind of build on that because I know I could talk about it forever, but I'm super excited. Well, yeah, man, it was actually, uh, I was talking to a well-known granny granny witch. Yes. I was talking to a well-known granny witch in the area and we had had this big, long conversation and she was telling me all these different stories and, uh, you know, how she grew up and just all these awesome experiences that I had to share. But the next time that we met her and I started asking her, you know, some follow-up questions, that's something that she theorized and explained to me was that she said in her belief that the Appalachian mountains or, or in her belief, there were some old, old ancient entities that were in her words, wreaking or raising all kinds of cane all over the earth. And they had to be put in prison to keep them from raising all this cane. So she believes the reason that there's so much weird in Appalachia, especially central Appalachia, is because these entities were placed, were imprisoned under the Appalachian or within the Appalachian Mountains. And that over time, through weathering and erosion, and specifically when we started coal mining in the area and literally drilling into what she thinks are the prisons for these entities that we just started releasing these things. And that's the reason for, for all the weird that you see in Appalachia. And it's so interesting because like with me, obviously, you know, I'm a Christian. I have a biblical worldview. If you look at Genesis six and you look at the way the fallen angels were, were handled, we'll say by God, by Yahweh, that's that's how it kind of happened. The 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 fallen angels that committed the most ruthless sins against creation and against you know God's creation of humans. Well, the Bible explains that they were restrained and that some were placed under the Euphrates River. So we already have this context of fallen angels or these old gods, you know, little g gods, being restrained and placed underground in these these prisons so with her theory and she didn't mention any of the genesis 6 stuff that's just what started banging in my head but with her theory and something that i didn't even think about there's an excellent um horror audio drama podcast out there called old gods of appalachia and the creators of that show they're actually from a small town about an hour from us Um, also in Southwest Virginia. And I didn't even think about, you know, when she was talking about this, and I know this lady has never listened to the show. I mean, she, when I asked her to come on the podcast, she said she was not coming on our stupid radio show. (laughs) So, but she's she's pretty right on though. I mean, she's pretty close. (laughs) But the premise of of the, the kind of the preface of that whole show is a lot of these old entities, these old gods that roam around and kind of disguise themselves in different ways. You know, they're the owners of, they're the owners of the coal companies and the railroad companies and all these major corporations. But that's kind of how they come around was, you know, once we started drilling into the mountains. So that theory was, was awesome coming from her. And I never really thought about it other than in a fictional kind of take. But if you really think about it, you have one of the oldest mountain ranges in the world. You know, if you believe from a biblical standpoint, like I do, if you believe that, you know, God dealt with these fallen angels and and imprisoned them, what better place would there be to imprison them than the Appalachian Mountains? I mean, because we know for the majority of well, the human history that we know about anyway, the the documented or the mainstream of what we get, 
a lot of central Appalachia was not inhabited for the majority of the time. A lot of these native tribes actually called certain areas uh, like where we live in southern West Virginia and eastern Kentucky, especially, they called it dark and bloody ground. So it, it makes you think, why? Like, why would these tribes only come in here to hunt and farm at seasonal times throughout the year, but they wouldn't really create any kind of full time settlements? I mean, it, it makes you think, man, like this old granny witch, she really, really may be on something. So we can't take full credit for that theory. We're just latching on and, and yeah. going with it from here on out. Uh, Ryan, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, from a biblical standpoint, it lines up, man. This is the difference between Justin and I. This is why he does all the talking, because I would have said fallen angels – came on to the daughters of men. God didn't like that. The fallen angels with the loads of gods, he locked them under these mountains. The Nephilim bloodline continued, and that's these big rich people from up northeast that started all these mines down here, mine the holes in all these mountains, releasing all this shit. Oh, I'm so, can I cuss on here? Yeah, it's fine. I'll put a warning at the oh. end. Now, I didn't even think about that. I didn't either. That's genius. That's genius, right? That's everything you just said. No, he didn't no. connect that. That they were trying to get their basically the head of their bloodline back out. Yeah, I did well, not. They connect can't that. actually create more nephilim. They without them. So, what would you need to do? I like it. I wasn't even thinking about that. That's genius. This is why they keep me around, Justin. When Joel hears this, when Joel hears this, Ryan, oh gosh, he is gonna love you. <sighs> Here's new favorite. Here's new favorite. Well, I hope he likes me already. I thought... <laughs> You're about to be his new favorite, though. <laughs> so there you go, oh, Joel. I'm not trying to brag, Justin, but uh, <clears throat> we make Granny's pucker. <laughs> that is true. That is true. We're not even really sure what that means. I don't know. I don't want to know. You know, that's enough. You win. I'm hoping she's just letting me use my imagination because I've thought of <laughs> many different things. I don't know. There's something about the the side of the dynamic that doesn't talk as much that older women enjoy. Because every conference, still to this day, we just had one this past week and of recording this, a 50 to 70-year-old woman will actively... Hardcore hit on Jay. I mean, to a sometimes an obnoxious level. Uh, the one lady almost had actually had Jay to her car looking at pictures of Bigfoot. He was gone for an hour. Where and I actually Joel and Sean Killer Mockingbirds had to go find him because I'm in the booth by myself and I'm like he's been gone an hour and a half. He's dead. Did he? Uh- <laughs> Did he come back smiling? No, he's like, she gave me a Bigfoot picture. Because they went out, and they're like, hey, Jay, Justin needs you at the booth. And he's oh, like, okay. Jay. He walks around, you know. And I'm like, that woman was trying to abduct you. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> that is awesome. But no, I think she's, I really think she's right. And so here's some of my dots. The second yes. you started saying that, something, an old memory clicked, and I started d- diving into research. So you guys watch Mountain Monsters, I'm sure, right? Yeah. So we're good friends with Wild Bill. I just talked to him on the phone a couple nights ago. Uh, they're crazy. Awesome. They're a crazy bunch of dudes. But their research team, their actual research team, not the show people, do really good research to help them produce the show. Uh, and, you know, they're real people. They're, they're normal people outside of their characters and stuff like that, you know. But they do do a lot of really good research for some of these cryptids and some of the backstories against them. Now, did you watch? It was I think their la- latest season with the Tiger Valley, or the Tigris Valley there in either West Virginia or Virginia, with the with the coal miner stuff. Mm. So basically, I don't think so. You should watch it. It's really it's it was weird because I'm like, what is happening? I don't get it. Like I don't get. But they started showing about these small earthquakes. And stories of stuff cr- crawling out of the, the bore shafts. So they would drill in to get a test for the coal. They come back the next morning. It would all be pulled apart, and it would look like giant claws 
had clawed their way out and pushed the actual mining equipment off to the side. And I thought that was kind of weird because I'm like, normally, they, you know, they do, you know, it's a fun show, but they do some research. So I wonder where that came from. I have uh, a couple of Adam Benedict's books, Monsters in Print, Oddities in Print, stuff like that. It pretty much just takes old newspaper clippings and puts them in these giant books. Anything weird. There is a bunch of stories. A bunch of stories of these coal miners doing these test boreholes and devils escaping. Yeah. Literal devils. Uh, they even found one that was in a giant piece of coal and they had it on display for a little bit. And then they came back and the next morning it was gone. It, it wasn't, the coal wasn't missing. Whatever it was woke up and got out of the coal it was in. And I think she's right. I think that there is, whether they're the little G gods, the Nephilim, or even ancient creatures from the time before, you know, because all that coal is made from basically marsh from yeah, when that was the true. only thing on the planet, you know, quote unquote. So if they just, maybe they hibernated and now they're waking up if you want to go that, you know, but I didn't even think about the Nephilim thing now with the rich people trying to dig them out because that would make sense. Well, What's funny to me is I thought this whole time that's what Justin's been saying. I've never said that out loud. No. <laughs> that's all you. That was all you, Ryan. That was genius. Because that, that would genius. make sense. You think about how destructive. And I know coal mining, I, I went to school in Appalachia. It killed a lot of industry. It killed a lot of family when it started going away. But coal yeah. mining is such an environmental destructive process. Oh, my gosh. It's literally... it's. Co- the sulfuric acid alone that comes out of these stuff, let alone the radioactive material that's attached to coal. Uh, I used to have to do Geiger counter surveys on the Ohio River, and that's all from coal slosh pits getting into the Ohio River. And there's these massive pits of radioactive material on the bottom of the Ohio River from, you know, 60, 70 years ago. And it's not going anywhere. It's super heavy. It's You know, you can't get down there and mess with it because you're going to get ran over by a coal barge. You know, they're still yeah. flying down the Ohio River every day. But when you guys said that, that clicked, and I started doing this research, and I, you know, eventually we're planning on doing a whole episode on it. But we want to talk to you guys first about it because I think it's real. I think there's whatever these entities are, even stuff like the Smiling Man, stuff like that. Appalachia's always held the weirdest, the weirdest quote unquote cryptids. I don't even think some of them are cryptids anymore. But these entities that are so astronomically odd. Uh, you know, like the West Virginia veggie man that literally talked, you know, he talked to a guy before he drank his blood. Yeah. And, but, you know, trickster gods, that kind of old thing where they don't really make sense. The green man, you know, Hellier did the whole thing about the green man being in Appalachia. Yep. I think you're, I think she's right. You guys are right that that's maybe these things. I didn't even go on the Nephilim line with it being. No, that was. That was really genius, Ryan. That was that was genius. That was the missing piece that I've been waiting on this entire time. But no, I Justin, thought he, that's what you've been saying this entire time. <laughs> well, I'm glad you thought that. I, I'm glad that you were giving me credit for your missing piece of the theory. But think how much because that makes genius. sense. They're, it's they're genius. Destroying mountains and habitat. That, so people don't realize this. Appalachian Mountains, specifically Tennessee, is the most biodiverse place on the planet. Yo. On the planet. It's not in a rainforest. It's not, you know, in some it's it's in Tennessee, in Kentucky. The most well, there's certain parts of Appalachia that is is still literally considered a moderate rainforest yes. now. Yeah. Modern uh, day. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like people so, don't realize it that, you know. Smoky Mountain yeah. National Park has five species of salamander that are only found in Smoky Mountain National Park. Yeah, that's insane. One valley, you know, it's just there. There's five species that only fi- are found in one valley. They can't go over the tops. Yeah, it's the own. It's their own e- ecosystem. It's like their own little personal ecosystem. It's it really is amazing, man. It really is amazing the diversity that we have here, despite the coal mining and the strip mining and, and the gas welling and all that. So that's why Ohio Appalachia is so poor. So our hills and mountains are small enough that they actually just moved them. Uh, they strip mined. They just cut the tops of them. And anybody that may be not at home familiar with that, most of our mines were strip mines, and they just basically moved the mountain. So that's why you don't see really big trees in Ohio, part of Appalachia, that kind of stuff. Because the coal was close to the surface, it wasn't worth digging these big shafts down to it 
It's easier just to move all that rock and habitat on top. Yeah. But yeah, but you think about, I mean, you mentioned Hellier, you know, think about, you know, some of the stories that came from that, you know, these little, these little goblins coming up out of the old abandoned mine shafts. Uh, you know, you can listen to coal miner stories going back, you know, 100, 150 years now. And they talk about the Tommy knockers. Tommy when knockers. I described them, it was the same kind of thing. You know, it was these little goblin looking things. Uh, you know, they talk about seeing fairies in, in, in the mines and all this different stuff. Um, I, I just read a book a little while back called The Rebirth of Pan. Uh, and, it's, and that's kind of what it's talking about, you know, is all through history. Even the, just for one example, you know, the Greek oracles, you know, like the oracles of Delphi, they would literally just hang out above these fissures in the rock in, in, you know, where all these steam and all this stuff would come up and they would claim that that's where their information came from. You know, you talked about these trickster gods, you know, you're, you're think you're looking at paying. Well, that's who these oracles said that they got their information from that pan would speak to them from these fissures and appear to them and all this different stuff. So, I mean, you're thinking that it, it's all along the same lines of you have this, you know, just for instance, let's say that that pan, this trickster God is kind of a central intelligence and in all of the weird that's going on. Well, he has this whole army of, of devils, like you said, that are just hanging out, you know, hibernating or waiting on their chance to to be released. Or Ryan actually made a statement, and I, I don't want to jump the gun on our treasure hunt or anything too early, but Ryan made a statement early on because we've said a couple times, it feels like we're being led. On this journey that we are on, it feels like there's some form of intelligence there that's that's leading us. That's just opening doors before we can get there. Ryan said, dude, what if this has just been paying the whole time, telling us where to go dig just so we can go let him out? I was going to say, remember what the rat says. There's no such thing as free cheese. Yep. <laughs> it's you true. Know, you keep following those breadcrumbs, and if the, if the path is too easy, I would be very careful. Well, it, it started out pretty easy. It's continually getting. That's why this trickster god thing. He's been playing a whole lot of tricks. Yeah. <laughs> turns out, turns out, treasure hunting is really hard. And turns out, if he is tricking us and how to release him, that would be stupid. I would just want you to come find me as fast as possible. Unless it's a ritual that he, you know, there's a whole pattern of stuff that has to happen before he's released. Oh yeah. Well, true. we're not true. doing anything weird, man. So. You don't know. Walking in a circle may be doing it. Ooh, Ryan. You walk in a half circle all day long, every day. <laughs> You're <do>. halfway there. <laughs> just, oh never, just never Man's go around clawing the at the door. The I can never turn left again. <laughs> well, we're actually we're actually doing research right now on an episode that we're we actually may even be recording it this weekend. Um and just give a little it's about the far southwestern county in Virginia, Lee County. You know, it's really you have the Cumberland Gap. You know, every, everybody the Cumberland Gap is famous for that's the pathway that Daniel Boone took through Virginia into Kentucky that kind of opened up that western expansion in 1775, right? So Daniel Boone kind of led the way, or what we're told, Daniel Boone led the way for this western expansion. So the Cumberland Gap is really famous for a whole lot of things. You know, it was a it was a huge passageway for during the Civil War times. Um, you know, all this different stuff. It's all throughout history. The Cumberland Gap has been used for a lot of different things. But we a, a listener actually sent a newspaper article from what's called the Dickinson Star. It's the county that that we live in, Dickinson County, Virginia. And the Dixon Star, this guy was writing this entire article about all of these cave systems and these caverns and all this stuff in Lee County with all these creatures that would come out and chase people at night and talk about how students would go and travel these cave systems and try to find and it just go for miles and miles and miles that the mountains were 
like honeycombed with all these different tunnels and, and cave systems and all this different stuff. So we're getting ready to dive in an episode on that pretty soon uh, and just how a bunch of different stuff fits in with with that county and the Cumberland Gap and and all these stories. But still, like you said, there's so many stories out there of creatures of some sort and all kinds of different sorts that come out of these cave systems, come out of these mine, these old abandoned mine shafts. All these stories from these miners saying that they hear and witness, um, and even in Old Gods of Appalachia, you know, I know that it's a fictional podcast. But I'm sure these people are thinking a lot of the same things that we're thinking and theorizing a lot of the same things that we are to be able that's to face ex- it. That's exactly where I came up with that theory just now. It's the same thing. Yeah, you're the right. The railroad people and the mining people where the demons and the old man goes down into the cave all the time. Yeah. What's he doing down there? That's... I don't, it's crazy. So I'm going to run you through a scenario real quick because I wanted okay. to do this. So let's say the year is 1947, the year of the Roswell crash. You both are small time coal miners. You have your borehole rig. You start drilling a hole. Uh, you know, you're X feet down. You feel like you're getting into coal. All of a sudden, you hit a cavern. The, you know, the shaft just kind of drop, drops for a minute pull it back out, and you could just hear something claw on its way out that way. What's your next move? Uh, Am I with Justin? Yes, sure. (laughs) Push him in the way. I was going to say trip my partner, but I guess I wouldn't trip Justin. I would push you down Uh, a hole, Jay. I know you're (laughs) listening to this. I just, I know Justin's kids. (laughs) <laughs> so, I guess I'm just going to hope for the best It's hard to look at them when you get out You're like I kind of pushed your dad in the way I tried yeah. to save him I tried you, you couldn't say that with a straight face <laughs> I tried everything that I could There just there wasn't any hope I was just way faster Why did he always have to try and be the hero? No um, I would Run really, really fast, as quickly as I could in the opposite direction, and if that was my job, whatever foreman shows up, I'm saying, hey, look, there's other minds around, or not even other minds, I'm just, I'm doing something different for the I'm, rest of my life. I I'm never I, going back. I think I'm selling my house and buying a farm. Moving yeah. out west. Yeah. So, that's an actual encounter. Uh, that kind of pre-set up story I have the newspaper article over there, but this guy, so he was working for himself. At this point, there was a lot of these backyard coal mines, mm-hmm. and he was literally on a free claim looking for coal. He kind of fell backwards and described this creature. It was really hard for him to describe because it was kind of enveloped in black, like almost fog as it was com- like coming out, and it flew up into the air and took off. And as he was getting ready, you know, he got out of there, obviously, but weeks in that valley, uh, and I believe it was the Tiger or the Tigress Valley. I can't remember now. Uh, weeks and weeks after, there was everything from like these wolves that were made of smoke to these giant horned beasts to all this stuff popping up, killing all kinds of livestock. There's dozens of articles about it. But the weird thing is every creature was different. So is it the same creature that's shape-shifting or did he unpop the cork for that area in Appalachia? And these things... <laughs> The big one was what poured out first, and it almost to me sounded like a snaily gas. He just described this undescribable mass with wings that was just emanating black smoke behind it, like it was the first thing. It was huge, uh, you know. He described it being as big as his truck with the drill rig on the back. Uh, you wow. mean, I, can you imagine seeing something that massive crawling no. its way out of a hole and then just taking off? No, it reminds me of. A show my son got me into called Adventure Time. Love it. When the when the Ice King made Finn go over into the spirit realm and clog that hole off so those little things would stop touching him. Yes. I can't feel him touching me, but I can see him. <laughs> well, I mean, you're kind of talking about the same thing, you know? Yeah. 
Except these things it's can't so, touch you. They're eating cows. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's so hard. Yeah. Like that's where They're I just, struggle. That's where I struggle the most at with all of this stuff. Like how much of this is in our physical realm that we can somehow breach that veil, you know, breach that wall in between us and them and allow these things out? Or how much is it just the spiritual realm that by some happenstance, you know, with electromagnetic, you know, whatever, that somehow our worlds, our, our, the difference, that boundary between the physical realm and the spiritual realm somehow collides and it gets real, real sticky and you're not able to pull it back apart. You know, that's where I struggle the most because, you know, I hear so many stories and so many encounters that, you know, it's almost like somebody has, has, has breached that wall into the spiritual realm and that's where they are occupying for a little bit of time, you know, and you see that through, uh, you know, ritual magic. You see that through geomancy. You see that through uh, the taking of psychedelics. You see that through a lot of these different things that kind of alter that state of consciousness to the point that somehow they're able to contact and, and have interactions with these things in a different spiritual realm, you know, you, you, the machine elves, all this different stuff. People describe the same things, but then you have accounts like that where it's just some dude out working, you know, doing his everyday thing. Like nothing is changing. He hasn't altered any kind of state of consciousness. He's not trying to do anything, but he breaches a physical wall and boom pops the cork on uh, the seventh layer of hell and all this stuff comes pouring out. I mean, that's where I, I'm like, it's hard to even theorize why and how, you know, a lot of this stuff happens and goes on. And, you know, I don't know. I, I think that this lady, this old granny witch is really on to something. I think both of you boys are on to the same kind of thing and, and talking about it. And I think that that's that's one of the reasons that we just we have so much weird. Why I have an entire book here. I mean, this is a gigantic book. Tales of the Caddy Wampus. It's, it's it's huge. It looks like a school textbook, <laughs> and it is full of weird cryptids, like one-off cryptids. I mean, just a hundred of. Them that only occupy this area of central Appalachia, mainly West Virginia, which, I mean, we might as well be. West Virginia, I mean, <laughs> is the single weirdest state in the Union. For sure. <laughs> I mean, Ohio, Virginia, uh, you know, uh, Wisconsin are pretty close. But the random one-off monstrosities yeah. that come out of West Virginia. Yeah. I think they're drinking too much water out of the Ohio River. Especially now. Well, now they're all well, dead. West, West yeah, Virginia that, is that weird yeah. buffer between us and you. <laughs> West yeah. Virginia is that weird buffer right in between. It's it's insane. But I... I so, you know, if you look at pre-1900s, most cryptids were biologically feasible. And what I mean by that, you know, it's most of these things you could see fit in the family tree somewhere of something. Yeah. You know, they weren't... They were crazy animals. They're, we have crazy animals today. Uh, but they were feasible. And then it seems like after that century flip, we start getting veggie mans and moth mans and goat mans and white things and undescribable tentacle monsters, the octo man, the, you know, a 30 foot mass of tentacles riding in the Ohio River. Dozens of people seen it almost got hit by a semi. And yeah. it, then it disappears, never seen again. And so, yeah, what is that trigger? Is it the physical thing, like we said, you know, with this busting into like an actual quote unquote jail cell and letting them out? Or is it this interdimensional th stuff? And I think it's a mix. Uh, you know, we talked about in our Mothman series about them doing stranger things in real life underneath these bases and stuff like that. I just talked to somebody, I can't name names, about maybe or maybe not the base in Idaho. And maybe or maybe not what's happening there. Uh, and 
I'm talking to him right now for some episode research. And the amount of stuff that we're doing in these places, and I think some of these monsters, cryptids, weird things, are byproduct. You know, like, are they more interdimensional? Like, the, like uh, Indrid Cold, is he, an act- is, you know, is he from the jail cell? Is he from another dimension or whatever? So I think it's a good mix. And I think Appalachia just happens to get the blunt of all of it. It's, and I think it is due to the age. You know, I think it. I think it's due to the age, and I really think because you know you said a really key thing there. Pre nineteen hundred, you have all of these weird cryptids. Well, what really, really, really ramped up at that time? Industrial coal revolution. Mining. Yeah, coal mining. Yeah, industrial revolution. Coal mine. Coal became the number one fossil fuel used across the U.S. around that same time. You know, coal mining. It technically started in the 1700s, almost yeah. as early as white settlers got over here, and probably and, and before that. You know, I'm not taking away from any of the natives, but as far as documented history, we know that in the 1700s, coal mining was happening. But what, like Ryan was talking about, where he worked, where you're, he's riding a 20 uh, elevator, 2600 foot underground on the in this shaft, right, going down this portal. That, that kind of coal mining wasn't going on. No, it was very surface layer. That kind layer. of stuff, absolutely. That kind of stuff started, okay, if I'm going to put somebody in prison, I'm not going to put them with a a sheet, a, a satin sheet in front of them and close it and say, you better not come out of here. No, I'm going to put them behind a foot-thick steel or iron door with bulletproof plexiglass windows is the only thing they can look out of or see. And if they're real bad, I ain't even going to put that in there. And I'm going to have this bolted and locked down to where they absolutely, there's no way they're getting out. Okay. But I'm down, Lieutenant. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> That's my old corrections started coming out. <laughs> so if by some time you're, you're talking the same way, if there's something in that cell Say, you know, uh, I don't know, 100 pounds of gold just so happened to, to show up in that cell and that door is completely welded shut and bolted. Guess what? If I want that gold bad enough, it's kind of one of those things. Well, to heck with this prisoner that I just put in here. I'm going in there. I'm drilling through. I'm getting that gold. Well, in turn, I'm releasing that prisoner. So, again, just like you said, like the rat always says. The cheese ain't free. Things- these ain't free. So that's a really important time stamp there too, is when these weird one off once in a lifetime cryptid, you know, these ultra terrestrials, like you're talking yep. about the injured colds and, and all these that, you know, it, I don't know. I have no idea. I just know that Appalachia, all of Appalachia, but central Appalachia, Specifically, there's all this weird, all the craziest, weirdest stories that sometimes don't even make any sense at all. You know, like one of the stories this granny witch was telling us that you can go back and check out on this this episode, Chronicles of an Appalachian Granny Witch, um, talking about how her sister saw what she described as the devil, saw this this goat man looking thing but like it, it's all the old christian viewpoint or the descriptions of the devil of satan well it's also the same as as pan and all these other horn god deities that have been worshiped all throughout history like a suitor too like what how do you say that a suitor uh, i can't ever remember the goat the goat man hybrid thing from oh a satyr satyr yeah, oh, thank yeah, you yeah 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 and 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 that's the thing too. Like I know that all these things are all, you know, there there's accounts of them all throughout, you know, human history. There is. You can you can find them in every culture, every civilization, and I think that's the biggest uh evidence for the biblical narrative as far as these these fallen angels and the Nephilim and all this different stuff. But I feel like if there were a vast majority okay, if these things are just like with humans, we have certain ethnicities, right? 
you have whites, you have black people, you have Asians, you have, uh, you know, Hispanic, you have Latina, you Latino, you have all these different ethnicities. Okay. So what if all these creatures in this whatever realm that they're operating in are the same kind of thing? They they've been created and they've been their bloodlines are the same looking kind of creatures. Think about Narnia, right? Think about like Chronicles of Narnia. You have all of these creatures, but some of them are good and some of them are bad, just like with with humans. Okay? If a bunch of these creatures committed the most atrocious sins against God, well, they may have been the same. It may have been a really, really evil satyr that committed these sins that was locked away in the prison of the Appalachian Mountains. But the really, really good ones, well, they were they were talked about in Greek mythology. They brought knowledge. They brought you know all these different things. They had festivals. They had all these. So I don't know, man. It's like, like, what if these were just, there were multiple of these things, just like humans. Some were good, some were bad, but they all looked alike. They had the same kind of genetics, DNA. I don't know. It's just another. I... Hey, dark roast drinkers. Meet Duncan Midnight, our darkest brew yet. If you can't remember what type of roast it is, just close your eyes. Yeah, it's that dark. Wait, scratch that. If you're driving, please keep your eyes on the road and locate the nearest Dunkin' to pick up the darkest, roastiest coffee we've ever had. Brewed with bold taste and rich chocolatey flavor notes. Dunkin' Midnight, a surprisingly dark roast from Dunkin'. America runs on Dunkin'. I got a thought for you. That's why I was writing down. What if the physical body for these things is locked in the mountains, but what we're seeing, what we're experiencing is basically their psychic projection, the much mm. weaker version, the watered down version of them. They want out because they're, they're much weaker. Uh, like it's like literally on the zeitgeist. And that would explain yeah. like how these things like injured cold, the smiling man, all these things, they're kind of there, but not there. You know, they don't react yeah. to reality around them the normal way because they're more of a projection than anything. Like a lot of the men in black can't open doors, but they appear in built, they appear in rooms and they disappear from rooms because they're not out yet. It's their they're zooming in, they're zoom calling in. Hmm, that's good. I like that. Mm. I like that a lot. Ryan's businessmen are still trying to dig them out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go, the Joel. Nephilim, the Nephilim bloodline CEOs. <laughs> Gosh, Ron, that was I mean, It genius. makes sense. It makes sense, and that's why I keep laughing about it, because it, it tracks. It does, man. Literally, it's these gigantic scars. Anybody that hasn't seen acid mine drainage scarring from coal mining, it literally looks like the earth is bleeding to death. Yep. And for somebody to look at that and only see profit... Is probably not the nor like a good human being. I'm just going to put that out there. They're only in it for the money, right? And that's well, not nothing is, on the coal miner. Human being that can operate a business and watch these people die from this. That, that job will kill you. Hundred percent. When you retire from it, if you make it through your whole thing, zero injuries. When you leave there, you got something from it. Whether it's COPD, whether it's black lung, whatever, this knee replacements, you know, all that. But that's my theory. You keep the education system in these mountains down, the teachers struggling to teach all these kids, and you keep the welfare system in check that way. These certain people don't have to go get jobs. All they got to do is keep popping out kids to make that check bigger. And those kids, they go to school. Let's just say they're not the best to have to deal with. And then by the time they graduate, it's either let's go drill holes for a gas well or let's send them to the coal mine because you don't need nothing but a high school diploma to go make $30-something an hour. And that's all they need to hear. That's all they make? 
that's yeah. You could not get me into a hole ever, ever. There's no money. Uh, I don't like going into caverns, like for like just you know the the tourist traps. Let alone <laughs> you talking about dropping in a hole for twenty five hundred feet of a, and then all the rock around you is acidic and radioactive. Like you're saying, you're picking up something. There's there's something coming home with you, whether it's a demon or or black lung or radiation. Heck, they're yeah. all probably the same thing. That's what I was getting ready to say. It's all the same thing. But is there anything else we wanted to add for this kind of... I know it's not flushed out yet, but it's something I wanted to cover with you guys because I think it's an amazing idea. No, I think we covered... I mean, that's... We actually covered more than than the three of us. Uh, you know, me, Ryan, and Lance have actually you know sat down and talked about... You know, it's it's really interesting. I mean, the, just the thought. You know, it, it makes me think of... of uh, this hole that they drill, this giant hole that they drill for whatever they're doing in Russia, you know, in Siberia that time that yeah, they drilled down is eight miles or something yep. like that was the farthest hole that's ever been drilled on earth. And the sounds, Ryan, have you heard that? Oh my gosh. They're remind me human how, screams. Dude, it's scary. They hit hell. It's scary. <laughs> Uh, it's it's only eight miles down, huh? Well, so uh, yeah. that's so basically they had no wonder global warming's happening. They uh they dug I think it was eight something like that you know it was eight and change, but it got hotter faster than they were expecting, and the rock wasn't getting as liquid as they were expecting. It was a whole the data wasn't lining up. It was really in you know this is I think they finished that hole in the late nineties. Uh, and of course, it's Russia. You know they're not giving us all the data. Nobody's checked in on this, so it could all be fake. But I don't think it is. Yeah. But, yeah. So they were hitting a liquid or softer rock that was way hotter than it should have been, and it wasn't as liquid as it should have been. At the temperatures, it should have pretty much been just like punched a hole in a bowl of soup, but it was still rock enough. But it was super heat in the drill. They punched a hole in supposedly a big cavern. They put uh, these like instruments down there, recorded the sounds, and it just sounds like a whole bunch of people in a building on fire. It's not, it just yeah. makes your skin crawl. It's not. It's, it's scary. Well, well, with that thought, I think I just solved global. I just figured out why global warming's happening. We're, that big hole in Russia. <laughs> Population has skyrocketed since you know. The devil was around and getting kicked out. And a lot of people have died and hell's burning hotter than ever. And it's only eight miles down. It's so only eight. <laughs> it's melting everything and flooding the earth. Well, and that's only eight miles If we drill enough down. of those holes. Well, that's why the ice caps are melting. Down there. That's where he put the radiator when there was only like 30,000 people on the planet. You know, now there's eight billion. Yeah. And yeah. Las Vegas exists. <laughs> yeah, y'all got this figured out. Uh, Ryan's great you tonight. Need, Ryan needs to be running the world. I'm telling you, we, I think we maybe pull, Ryan's Nephilim bloodline. We pull the nuggets out of Ryan yeah, on Crippers yeah. of the Corn. I'm telling you, absolutely yeah. pulling on Ryan's nuggets on Crippers of the Corn. Pulling on Ryan's nuggets. That may be the title of the episode. <laughs> uh, before we move on to the kind of the next major topic, I had a little story for you. Uh, yeah. You talk about granny witches and all that stuff. My great grandmother, who I was very close with, was most definitely not a witch, but I had witnessed her being yelled at for being a witch. Uh, really? So she's this crazy forest lady. She's who I got my love for animals from. Hundred percent. There, was, she wasn't scared of any animal on the planet, but she was a, like a snake whisperer, and it freaked people out. Like, so she would always have like every gardener snake she caught. She'd do this weird little thing and pet it on the head, and it would like be in a trance. So she'd fill her pockets with gardener snakes, and they'd be in her hair and stuff like that. She'd put them in her hair. Little old lady, and we'd go mushroom picking, and you know, we, me and my my brother right under me, uh, we're all the ones old enough to go out with her, and she'd be like, "Okay, this one's extremely deadly, and this one's edible, and here's the only difference." And people would call her a witch. All this stuff. She had all these natural healing remedies. Great. Christian, God loving woman, you know, nothing nothing actually witchy about her. She just was with nature. She didn't hate snakes, was the big part of it. Uh so she had in her barn uh she had three giant black rat snakes. 
which in Ohio, that's our largest species of snake. And snakes are naturally very curious. And they don't just eat stuff like live prey and stuff like that. A lot of snakes will eat insects and, you know, they're opportunistic. She had these three giant black rat snakes in the barn trained to drink milk out of a saucepan. And so every day she'd go down and she had like a saucepan and she'd give them this pan of milk. These three big snakes would come out of these corners of the barn. They didn't have a single rat, I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, they come out, drank milk, and then it. I remember this lady, it was a friend of the family when she was kind of, I, I wasn't there, obviously, but uh, had seen Grandma go down there, give her snakes milk. She thought they were cats. So she went out there and seeing there were snakes, started whacking them with a broom. They got in a bad fight. All the snakes got killed by pigs. So they went into pig pens, and the pigs will eat like pigs will eat everything that moves if they can grab it. Yeah, it was a horrible fight. But she loved snakes. I mean, it was just she loved all animals: newt, salamanders, frogs. You know, they wasn't scared of nothing. I got a picture somewhere of her with like five or six snakes in her hair. Just she had big curly hair like I do, and she'd be you just see all these little heads poking out. But they were just That's just some. I think you're. I don't want the misconception to be that granny witches can't be Christian because they can be. Yeah, I'm and not uh, saying that. I'm just I, saying not I a witch. Feel like, I highly feel like you had a granny witch. Yeah, I think the <laughs> yeah. titles fight, but you know, you have that word witch, and people get that connotation yeah. with that word. Oh, my aunt came to me. I'm almost forty years old, Justin, and my aunt came to me. When we dropped that episode, and she's like, I seen on Facebook the other day, you're talking about witchcraft, right? I'm like, what the, please. Absolutely not. <laughs> no. no. But, but she, I remember her being called a witch. And it was like, she was definitely nothing like a witch. But that granny witch kind of feeling, you know, where she was just a woman of nature that wasn't scared of snakes. And her son, yeah. my grandpa... Up until the last year of his life, was absolutely petrified of snakes. <laughs> and I don't think I've shared this story on here. So he was in Vietnam. He got trapped in a foxhole on one rainy night. And so he couldn't light a cigarette because they'd see where you were and stuff like that. And he had rats all over him. Mm. And he finally, like, the rats kind of were freaking out and stuff like that. And he's like, I wasn't scared of the rats. But he's like, I felt, I heard a thud come in. I'm like, what, you know, and then something big kept pressing up against my leg. He's like, after like an hour, he's so he's, you know, he's like, I had, you know, water's coming in, whatever this thing's like pushing up on my legs. I lit a match. It was a gigantic Burmese python was in there eating all those rats. He used every bullet he had and they couldn't find a chunk of that snake. He got uh, like, he got so much trouble because they were in a like, uh, I can't remember what he used to call it, like a lights, like a lockdown, stuff like that because they were being attacked. The next day, he got so much trouble. They just found like quarter sized chunks of that snake. <laughs> His last year of life, though, he finally pet one of the snakes I have here at the house. He finally got over it. It just took 50 ish years. Man. But yeah, that's my granny witch story. I just, I, you heard it, and I'm like, yeah, people, not a witch. A granny witch and yeah. a witch are different things. Two totally yes. different things. And, and I, that's. That's something that we that we you know, we've used the term so much now. But early on, when we started describing, you know, what these granny witches were, you know, what this Appalachian folk magic and stuff is, the majority of these granny witches, you know, that's what they were. They were these hardcore hardcore Christian, you know, women of the faith that, and that's what we'd say: mix a little bit of herb healing in with a little bit of the Book of Psalms. Yeah, you know, that, that's what they that's what they did. Cheap. And the same things that they did that they brought over from, you know, the Scots Irish and, and the Germanic traditions from the old world, you know, they brought that over here and used this same kind of of you know, the prayers and the herbs and the all these different things and just being one with nature and gathering everything from there, number one, for necessity, because there weren't any hospitals or, or you had you know, to. real doctors around here. If you wanted to keep family members alive, well, then guess what? You had to birth the babies. Like You had to be there to, to deliver the babies. You had to find the salves and the ointments and the, the tinctures and all this stuff to heal the sick. 
you had to do all these things based on what nature was giving you, which I believe that everything, it, every cure for every disease is in nature somewhere. A hundred percent. But like, that's what these ladies had to do. But the same things that they did, you know, here in the, the late 1700s, 1800s, early 1900s, where these, the, the granny witch name came from, and it's really just a, a modern term. You know, nobody called them granny witches back in the time. They would call them water witches sometimes. Oh, yeah. Um, but, but that was based on their ability to douse, you know, to find whales. Yeah, that's what they did. They douse and they called them water witches. But it wasn't a derogatory term. It was a term of endearment and a term of awe. You know, my, my grandma, she would never, ever, ever let me or use the term granny witch but I can say witch doctor all I want to. And she takes that as a term of endearment because she was a midwife for a really long time. I've watched her, you know, heal different uh, diseases, not her heal specifically, but have the herbs and all this different stuff. But all these people that I'm talking about, they're super devout Christian women. They just use these things and, and the same things that they use and the same ways that they act within nature are the same reasons that a whole bunch of ladies in Salem got hung back in the, the late 1600s. Kind of. I mean, yeah. They, they mostly mean, got hung out of jealousy. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yes. It was, yes. And uh, mass hysteria. That's, that's a different episode. They were, yeah. Salem they were just mostly got hung history. because I don't really like Cheryl. I think Cheryl's a uh, witch. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. She she only brought a little hey, thing of wanna, cornbread. You want to go to the... You want to go to the local hoot nanny with me? Oh no, which which? Yeah. You know, they're done. You know, I think she was talking to a cat, and and she had a new come out of her pocket. You know, that's not normal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I watched her shape shift into a cat. I would have been burned alive. I talked to mushrooms, and the house is full of salamanders. Yeah, they'd have looked yeah, at me for two definitely. seconds. Like yeah. that man is insane. Which that's, which that may be the re the incarnate Satan himself. <laughs> you got a he's talking to mushrooms. He's bewitching all of the villagers. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so you guys, we've kind of already handed on it a couple times, but tell us what's up with the runes and the silver. Oh man, so. This is a four-hour conversation. Yeah. Uh, so we're gonna hit. We're gonna hit the high notes. We're gonna hit the high notes. Um, anybody it's that is, that. we are. We're just gonna hit the high notes, Ryan. Anybody that is interested in in kind of following along with our journey, you know, you can go check out our pictures and some of our posts and stuff over on Instagram. Uh, you can go check out some of our episodes. They're not hard to find. We have a couple cliff rock carvings in the Swift Silver Mind ep- episodes. Um, most every show that you go on, if you see us as making a guest appearance on somebody else's show, the majority of the time we're talking the, the glyphs. Yeah. We're talking the glyphs and the treasure. Um, there's been a couple. So, you know, early on when all this started, it was, it was just this overflow of information that we really had no idea what to do with. Uh, you know, and, and it started off initially with a listener of the show. I ran into him while camping. He was like, hey, have you ever checked out these these carvings on this cliff up above the town that we live in? I was like, no, man, I've, I don't even know what you're talking about. You know, I've lived here the majority of my life, the vast majority of my life. and I've never heard of these things. So he shows me these pictures and, you know, obviously I'm immediately intrigued. So me and Ryan and Lance, Ryan and Ryan's sons, we go check this thing out one day, dude. And it was just, it's amazing. Now we've put out, you know, these pictures, we've had a ton of different opinions from a whole lot of different people. Um, You know, there's been several geologists even get back with us uh, and they're split down the middle. You know, you'll have half say, Oh, well, these are carpet rocks. You know, they're found in a couple of different areas throughout, um, the U.S., I think one of them is, is in the Ozarks, this big carpet rock formations down there, you know, all this different stuff. Some of them will say, like, these 
Langlese lines or, or whatever they're called. Like there's certain natural formations that do look kind of similar to what we found there, but nothing that I've found in, in researching and looking up as intricate. That's the thing with us with these carvings. And you got again, you can go check out these pictures on Instagram. They're so intricate. Like you have these humanoid looking figures that that are carved into there. You know, you just don't see that in nature. Now I know with pareidolia, you know, people can say, well, yeah, this looks like that. This isn't what this is. I mean, they're literally humanoid figures, two different humanoid figures that are carved into this thing. Um, just the way that these things are now, am I saying, I can't say that none of this was natural because maybe, you know, maybe this was something that was kind of taking place natural and, and an ancient people came across it or, you know, a people, a couple hundred, few hundred years ago came across and said, Hey, that's really cool. Let's dude it up a little cooler. You know, I, I don't know that, but I know, I know that at some point somebody has done some handiwork with this thing and, and made it as intricate as it is now who did it why they did it what time frame they did it we have no idea there's a hundred thousand different opinions so justin i think you had an opinion on this and a theory well, as long as i'm not dumb because i may be looking at the wrong picture <laughs> that's it. no that's the right one okay that's it. okay just making sure i wasn't an idiot uh like am i looking at the wrong rock uh no so you know what they say about opinions Opinions are like buttholes. Everybody's got one. Most of them stink. No, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, no. So did I know you guys? I, one of the episodes, and now I can't remember it. Uh, really bad host. But w- you had like I was thinking about a lo- like most people age a lot of these Viking rocks and stuff like that with lichen. But you guys mm-hmm. said that on one of the episodes. Did that ever yeah. anything ever come of that? No, no we haven't man. aged it with a lichen yet. Yeah, so, yeah, that's something that we're still looking toward getting done See, that's the weird thing about this rock and where it is it's it's on private property so what we can do is mm-hmm. really limited and it all has to kind of come through the, the land landowner owner. yeah there so yeah uh so yeah anybody didn't know at home lichen or a little group of uh algae basically complex algae that live forever like literally, a lot of these lichen in Iceland and stuff like that are fifty, sixty, seventy thousand years old, and they're really able. You know, people mess with rocks and they start growing, so they're really, really good age. You know, ageable things. But to me, I was talking to Jay about this, and I, this is one of the things I wish he was here for. It remarkably looks like the marbling, like the design on the top of the old Roman churches, the open churches. So going back mm. to uh, some of the uh, ancient cultures that maybe used to live here, even giants, going all the way back to giants, it may be a relic. To me, it kind of looks like the piece of off of a building and it's just what's left of it, rubble. But you got one piece of war down design that was on top of one of these archways. Uh, that's what the second I seen the picture, I'm like, that looks like I, I there was a couple. I was that big Roman church they rebuilt, but there is a piece from that church. It almost looks identical. So to me, it goes back to that global race. Whoever was this circumnavigable, you know, group of people, or maybe people, maybe not people, uh, that's what I think. I mean, it's not carpet rock, in my opinion. I'm not a geologist. I was a biologist specializing in fish and amphibians. So, but it does. So was this carving created by fish or amphibians? I would be impressed. (laughs) <laughs> them are some good fish now you want to hear okay now i'm really hey, bad what are those one fish that make those at the bottom of the ocean? i was just coming up to it they make those they uh, they couldn't ex- circles two to three hundred feet wide so yes. uh, they, people couldn't explain this mystery for centuries they would find these giant uh crop circle like the de- intricate designs that are you know, two to three hundred feet wide and we didn't discover this until like 96, 97. It's a puffer fish cousin that is so tiny, and he meticulously cleans it off with one fin, and he's about two inches long and maintains it's this tiny. giant intricate circle that's 300 feet across. So, yeah, I guess it could be fish. 
Yeah. Back when Appalachia was wet. Yeah. 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 Long time ago. Long time ago. But no, to me, it's, and everybody, I suggest you look at it. It does not look like a natural formation. The symmetry is uh, extreme. Uh, yes. And I've seen formations, especially like we'd go down to Arkansas and Texas and stuff like that and see some of these really big exposed formations. And ha- they have symmetry, but nothing. This is real symmetry. This is not pareidolia. This is actual. I mean, it looks like the design off an old Roman church. And or I guess not a, not a church. What do they call those gigantic open air buildings, a worship center, basically for their gods. Like the, the not the Colosseum, the uh, not the Pantheon. It. I can't think of what it's called. Great yeah. research. It, it was right on the tip of my tongue, and then I lost it. I, I drank that it. whole Mountain Dew, and I had to step outside for a minute. Go ahead, buddy. Keep Go talking ahead. about this rock because I have another theory, Justin. Okay. That I haven't got to talk to you about. Awesome. Ooh, I'm Dude. excited. We'll keep That's talking awesome. about it. But anybody that hasn't seen this, there's basically a, like the main part of the design is like a center, almost like a ladder step design with two, with circles on either, giant circles on either side of it. There are interlocking circles, like a donut. Uh, it's incredibly inter- intricate, incredibly long. The only thing I could see it being kind of natural is a gigantic organism's fossil. Uh, yeah. So there was, I don't, there was a trilobite. Uh, they literally thought it was writing in this rock, and it was a trilobite's footsteps. It looked like it looked like some ancient writing. People were trying to decode it for like a hundred years. Finally, they looked a little further and they found the trilobite. Uh, it wow. all got crushed in the landslide. Uh, so that's the only thing I could see because the symmetry is real. So organisms have symmetry. Uh, yeah. So I don't know if it's something like that. It's it's interesting. So you guys. How did you guys come about this? You said a buddy told you about it. Yeah, a listener of the show, a good friend of mine. Uh, you know, we were actually talking about at the time we were looking at doing like a little mini doc. You know, uh, about the the river that ran through the town that we live. Uh, it runs really close by to Hellier, Kentucky. You know, there's a lot of weird stories that come along this one particular river. So we were looking at doing a little mini documentary and I was talking to this guy about that. And he was like, you know, I was talking about like, you know, actual historical things that had done, you know, conflicts between the natives and the settlers and how, you know, the native folklore talked about all these different tunnels throughout the mountains. So they could get, you know, from where we were to the breaks interstate park. That's like 15 miles away, just within, you know, an hour's time through the mountain on foot, you know, like all these different things I was talking to him about. And that's when he mentioned it. He brought it up. He's like, well, have you seen these these carvings? And I mean, I, I had no idea. You know, nobody around here even cares. Like, it's it's nothing. We'll bring it up and start yeah. talking about it. And the majority of people are like, oh, uh, yeah, that's, that's cool, I guess. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, I mean, you know, it's one of those things. Like, we encourage all the time. We encourage our listeners, look in your own backyard. You know, his, like, weird is everywhere. History is everywhere. You know, the actual history like not what you're just force fed from from the mainstream and, and what they want you to believe like you know we were looking today about all these standing stones these these monolithic structures that are all throughout Appalachia you know that look like and date back farther than Stonehenge you know there's a a place around Winchester Virginia that is a mini Stonehenge that they've dated back to 10,000 BC. That's that's insane. That's insane. Hmm. So it's a it's kind of the same thing you were talking this this universal people that kind of did the same things, you know, in all these different cultures and civilizations. Now, Ryan, I'm going to share my newest theory on what I think this rock may be. Do you want to deliver your theory first? This one that I haven't heard yet. Yes. Okay, do it. I think we need to go to the other mountain range across from there. Look for more rock carvings because looking at that thing, you got the one person on this side, and then you have the structure, which could be a bridge, by the way, between the two mountain gaps. And then you have 
the break in the rock that we thought was erosion, however, could have been done purposely because after the break in the rock, you have the other person standing there with their arms up. They could have symbolized the break in that bridge, like maybe those tribes were warring. Maybe. Maybe. That's interesting. That's a really good idea. You I was re- probably I was really hoping you were gonna say what I said when you were out of the room. <laughs> it's a giant organism's fossil. <laughs> yeah. Pre Cambrian. <laughs> yeah. Holy crap. Wouldn't that be crazy? Well, that's that what we were crazy. saying. Biological symmetry. Uh, yeah, we talked about there was a trilobite's foot tracks like is in the mm-hmm. sand that forever people thought was writing in stone, and because it was so intricate and stuff like that, they thought it was a language until they looked further on the rock and found the trilobite. It, uh, it, all, it all disappeared to mudslide, but that's crazy. I don't know. It's definitely not natural, as in the fact that it is just natural rock. Uh, just yeah. a natural rock formation. Something, it was either an imprint or somebody carved it. And I cannot remember the way. So there's, I'm not a geologist. Uh, <laughs> friend Christian, who's a treasure hunter, if you listen to this, hit us up because I want to know. But there's a way to tell if it's carved. And I never get this. I never understand this, whether it's carved in or carved out. And yeah. I don't understand what that means. I know it's significant. That's pretty much if all. It's carved in. It means that they, the carving was etched out of the rock. But if it's carved out, that means you take away from the rock around the design. And that's kind of how this rock is. It's like a, a it's like a three D representation. It's like the old. Yeah. It's like when you're in school writing the bubble letters. You know, like you know, you just make. Like that's how this is. Like it's everything is carved out to create the intricacy of the design that's left there. Uh, the majority of these native petroglyphs that you find, it's just a simple etching into the rock, you know, to make whatever figure they were going to make with these is totally different. It's everything else is carved out around the thing to make like this 3d representation. Like it's jumping out at you. So I don't know. That's really interesting, but, the theory, and, I, and I've only talked about this theory a couple different times. I talked about it with Shane on Inquiries of Our Reality because we've been on a couple different shows after me and my son went back up to this rock, and we spent hours just exploring the whole side of this mountain. And we actually went back up there to look for a landmark uh, where I think there may possibly be a cache of silver. But we'll get to that part. Uh, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to get to that. It point. may be a part two thing. Yeah. Maybe a part two thing. We may have to save the we'll silver. We'll save the for silver. A, Let's just save the silver. A, let's save the silver for a part two. So anyway, we go back up there to look for a landmark where I believe this cache of silver may be based on John Swift's journals. So it just so happens to be in close proximity to this rock and these, these carvings. So we go back, we go back up there, we're looking around and, you know, we check out the rock again. We're looking at all this. And like Ryan mentioned, there's this little break between the, the top of the rock. So you have this carving in its entirety. It looks like, and then you have this little break. And then on this other rock and just, it's probably only three or four inches it extends onto this other rock. So I told Connor, my son, I was like, let's go underneath this cliff, look around for where this other rock may have possibly broken off and see if that's kind of like we can find the missing puzzle piece to put back here and, 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 you know, see if it brings anything else to light. So we go underneath the rock, we're looking, and when we get down there, I start noticing that there's all these, these rocks that's, it looks like the same rock that the cliff is, is made of, but a lot of them are really angular and like one side really smooth and flat, almost look like they had been cut like really, really at, at right angles. 
And, you know, Ryan mentioned the other day, there's there's not supposed to be right angles in nature. You know, that's not something that nature usually does is a no whole lot of right lines. Angles. Right, no, no straight, straight lines. lines yeah. Nature. So we go down and we start finding all these different rocks that look like they've been cut. Well, we notice that there's a um, a second cliff facing further on down the mountain. So we go down and check it out. So we're looking at this cliff facing, you know, farther down the mountain. We're walking around the top of it. We're looking for more carvings, you know, see if we if there's something that we've missed. And we get to this this edge and we look down and there's like this perfect gap. I mean, this cliff facing goes hundreds of yards around the mountainside, you know, naturally. This cliff facing is just hundreds of yards around the mountainside. But right in the middle of this lower cliff facing is this, I don't know, 10 to 15 foot gap that is just like, it's, it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. And they're starting there and on up toward the mountain in kind of a uh, serpentine pattern up around to the top of this other cliff facing where the carving is there's all these stones that look like they've been cut. Well, you look off to your right from down there and there's this standing stone that's separated from the cliff facing. There's a gap, but it looks like, you know, by the laws of physics, it doesn't look like it should be standing. It looks like one simple breeze and this thing should be tumbling down, but it's there. You look off to the left and there's this gigantic rock part of the cliff that looks like the side profile of a human face. So I'm standing here on this lower cliff face. I'm looking at this gap between this, this lower face and how it leads up to the top where this carving is. I'm looking to my left. I'm seeing this profile of a human head. I'm looking to my right. I'm seeing this standing stone. And then my brain, I have terrible ADD. So it's really, really hard for me to just strip everything away and visualize something. But for some reason, this moment, dude, just like clarity hit. And I told Connor, I said, just, okay, postulate with me here just for just for a moment. Imagine that all the trees, all the foliage, all the soil, everything is stripped off of this mountain. And all you have left here is the stone, is the rock. Say that you're you're a couple hundred yards from this lower cliff face to where a settlement or something would have been right beside of the river. All right, we all know that civilizations they all based everything beside a river, they had beside of some form of waterway. So I told him, I said, imagine looking at this thing as a yes, we have a natural landscape with the cliff facing. But if you stripped everything away, it would almost look like if you if you melded uh, like these old South, like South American pyramids, the front face of a South American pyramid, where you have this this these steps going up the center up to the peak of these pyramids. What if there was an ancient people that saw this natural landscape, these cliff facings, maybe that break was already there. Maybe they fabricated a little bit to make it wider, to be able to get cert cert certain things up through there, cut these stones, make these steps, or whatever. What if we're standing on, what if this carving, what if we're standing on some form of ancient temple complex of sorts? And I mean, we know ancient peoples, they met their gods at the high places. That's where they would go to worship. That's where they would go to sacrifice. That's where they would go to perform these rituals and all these different stuff. They would go to the top of these mountains or the top of these pyramids or, you know, the top of these, whatever structures th that they were building or that was there. That's where they would go to worship. That's where they would go to speak to their elders and their ancestors. And, you know, they, they would do all these things there. So to be able to stand there and look and see this, double terraced cliff face with a, a profile of a human head rock. Those are called something, but I forgot what the name of them were. 
this standing stone over here, massive standing stone, and this carving right in the middle. I don't know, man. Like it's to me, I think that it would make perfect sense. The archaeology in North America is purposely, I guess, misleading would be the word, because we don't look for stuff like that here. Every yeah. other continent on the planet, we look for that kind of stuff, but we yep. purposely ignore. Or purposely, it's designed to be ignored here. You know, we're told, like, what is it now? They moved it back a little bit, but it's like thirty-two thousand years or something. Yeah. Is you know, humans have been on this continent, and it's obviously it's much older. Uh, Graham Hancock's newest series. What is that mountain they found? That literally everybody they're farming on this mountain, and they finally figured out the whole mountain's a temple. And oh yeah, that was in. Uh, oh shoot! It's somewhere in, in Asia. Uh, yeah, but literally a, a full size mountain. And it, it, everybody, I suggest watch it at home because it's you don't realize how big you know. Everybody says a mountain, and you could think of like a big hill and stuff like that. No, it's <laughs> a mountain. A whole village was farming on top of, and then they, f- they uncovered the top, and they're like, oh, they built a temple on top of this mountain, and then they keep going back and going back and they're like, oh, you know, it's bigger, bigger. Oh, no, the whole mountain is man-made. Yeah. You know, and we've known men to destroy mountain. Why can't we build a mountain, you know, or modify an existing structure? Yeah. You know, that's yeah, human absolutely. nature. If you can make yeah. it work, you make it work. So when you're... Well, just, yeah. When you're describing I mean, this, uh, this little s- slide up the hill... Do you think it's like a staircase? Is that what you're getting at with all these right angles? Or what are you, what are you thinking? I think so. Okay. I think just in, in me totally theorizing here, I think that these stones that were that looked like they've been cut, I believe they were some sort of staircase or stair steps that were placed there. And, you know, over time, just like anything else, due to weathering, due to erosion, due to, you know, if – you find, you know, you look at a lot of these South American temples that have been found. Well, they were covered in jungle, you know, for a long, long, long time when these archaeologists and adventurers stumbled up on these things and started cutting their way through the jungles to look for whatever. And all of a sudden, boom, boom, they're striking stone with their machete. And then they keep clearing away and keep clearing away and keep clearing away. And eventually, holy crap, we have a we have a pyramid here. We have a whole temple here. I, it would not surprise me. You know, I'm not, I can't, I can't go out and say a hundred percent, but it would not surprise me if you were to take in a bunch of excavation equipment to this mountainside, if there wasn't a lot lying underneath the surface of all these, you know, who knows how long of, weathering and erosion and, and, you know, tree. And and that's the thing. Like a lot of this area has been logged. Yes. But usually when, when, unless it's just totally clear cut, you know, that you log certain trees, right? Yeah. You know, like me and Ryan, we work for a, a business. We, we cut, we work up maple trees all the time, curly maple. So that's kind of the way that logging is always been. You're looking for specific trees, unless it's just a clear cut, you know, taking everything, whatever, for pulpwood. But looking around at this area, there's there's a power line that, that goes by just 100 yards to your left. There's a massive power line that goes right through there, a big power line right away. Um, but a lot of these trees, I don't know, they're not – there's no old looking trees there. Yeah. Everything seems fairly, fairly new. Now, could it have been totally clear cut and log? Yeah, absolutely. Or could it have been log way prior? You know, I mean, I don't, there's, it's so hard to go and just judge the area based on, I know as far as, as me, I've been to a lot of places in the I mean, we live in the woods. I grew up in the woods, you know, hunting and fishing and exploring and hiking and, you know, all this different stuff. You know, I told you as you, as I enter the woods, yeah, I feel like I'm in an old 
place, but I don't always feel like I'm in a sacred place. Mm -hmm. When I'm here, I feel like I'm in a sacred place. I feel like I have to be careful with everything that I touch. I feel like that while I'm there, I need to be respectful and I need just more than usual. And it's, I know that sounds weird. I know that sounds like totally ridiculous, but I don't know, man, from the moment that we got there, the day that we first stumbled upon it to now, if, if I go there, I feel like I'm in a, a really energized place. Like that there's a lot going on that you can't see. And I know that sounds ridiculous. I know that sounds crazy. But that's just how it feels, man. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. So, and the trees don't even really matter for hiding this stuff. Like that, that group was farming on them. It was just soil. And they yeah. couldn't tell they were on top of a gigantic temple. You know, yeah. you know, a couple thousand years of dirt accumulating. There could be no trees. You still probably wouldn't see the actual thing. You know, it may be easier to see more, you know, standing stones, more, you know, more maybe heads and stuff like that are maybe hidden. But even with all the trees gone, you know, there's a couple thousand years at least of dirt accumulation on top of it. It yeah. would never expose. And I have to, I just have to say one thing. There are rocks that break at perfect 90 degree angles. <laughs> So I cannot remember the name of the stone. Me and Jay fought about it like a year ago. A year because uh, it's just because we pick at each other. Uh, but there's a certain type of rock, so it's called cleavage. You know how rocks break and stuff like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But this one type of rock, when you drop it, it always breaks in almost perfect uh, cubes. Hmm. And in nature, it'll have all these weird right angles on it. Like there's uh it's from Japan. It's off the coast of Japan. That's where they thought Lemuria was for a bit because they found this up, uh, upcropping of it and it had all these weird right angles and it looked like it had steps and it looked like it had all this stuff. And it was just because it was made of this one rock and you hit hmm. it with a hammer and it breaks off in 90 degrees. It's super weird. But that's a, a very s small thing that happens in one specific place. I just had yeah. to say it because I know Jay's going to be listening to this. I'm not going to tell him <laughs> anything we've talked about. And there's my dig at him. <laughs> but no, so I know we're go going pretty long on time, but Ryan, you were saying that there may be this bridge connecting these gap, like this over this gap. How big is that distance? Just from my head. That's pretty good. It's a pretty good span. Uh, uh, like Gatlinburg be... sky bridge or bigger, bigger than that. Isn't it? No, nah, it would probably uh, be about the same. Okay. Yeah, it'd probably be about the same. Just for something for my own mind to kind of visualize if it's up two miles or if it's, you know, 200 yards or. Well, it's visible. I mean, you can see it. it's literally from from mountaintop to mountaintop, pretty much just across the the road, the river, the railroad track. And then, you know, you got your other mountain. That's everything in Appalachia is cut in between mountains, you know. <laughs> So, yeah, it would Assuming probably be like this carving is pretty old. It was just going over the river. Yeah, <laughs> the bridge. What if they had ancient railroad tracks, Ryan? You don't know. You don't know what kind of technology. Be? You don't know what kind of technology they had. I don't know. Maybe they just. It may be the Tartarian uh, civilization that was there had this gigantic civilization built up, and we what we think is just. You know, part of a temple was this massive civilization, this huge complex of, you know, working industry and, and all this. Did we, you don't know. You don't know, Rob. So I disagree with Graham Hancock's stuff a lot of the times. But one thing I do think he's right that I've seen him argue many times is that when people say, well, if that stuff really existed, where's all the trash? Yeah. You know, it could be a whole society that didn't use plastic. You don't have to use plastic. You know, oh, yeah. if you're using other types of stuff, it may be very biodegradable. You know, the civilization's footprint could disappear very quickly. But I do think you guys have found because that's not natural. Whatever it is, it's not it's not a normal rock formation. And the only thing I think it could be if it is natural would be some kind of fossilized organism. Uh, and I don't think it's that. I don't, but I'm just saying the only 
actual natural thing of not a human or a human like thing carving that could be is a gigantic fossilized, you know, pre uh, Devonian organism. Well, a couple things that we want to do here at this place, we definitely want to do like the lichen age testing there. We would like to, to get the software and the ability to get like a 3d rendering of this, you know, to kind of see what's going on and be able to, you know, Jarvis spin it around in the air and check out this section and that section and just make all of it. And I want to get Ryan up there and have him cut his palm and let his blood drain into the grooves of this carving and see if it opens a portal into some sort of subterranean uh, underground reptilian civilization. Or the bridge will just that's, rebuild itself. Yeah, or the bridge. Not, holy crap, I didn't even think about that. That's all awesome. these rocks are picking up out of the valley and realigning. Oh my Dude, God. that would be That's so why the hands are in the air. It's showing you have to bleed your palms for the battery. <gasps> Justin, you just uh, blew my effing mind. Wait a minute. Does that mean one of us has to... There might be another rock on the other side. I bet one of us has to be on each one. I bet so. I bet it's like one of these God of War games back uh, the originals where I would get stuck at all these places because I had to have you know somebody over here and somebody over there and shooting an arrow here and doing all this and that some kind of intricate setup. Man, that you only have to get some handy dandy walkie talkies. Yes, or <laughs> cell phones. Please no, film this. I knew you were going to say that. I just want to see I two. I want to see your guys that. with walkie talkies with a knife to your palms. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Are you ready over there? Yeah, okay. And then the ground you starts first. shaking. You go first. No, same time. Same time. Same time. You gotta do it at the same time or it'll blow up. Ryan start Ryan start screaming, not chicken out. <laughs> See, it was easier because there were giants that built it so they could just kind of talk and yell at each other. Right, yeah. It was these red headed six fingered giants that made all this stuff that created this giant civilization and Everything was so much easier for them than it is for us. Blood powered equipment. That's the problem, though. Is it was look at all this temple sacrifices from around the planet. You know, all this technology was powered by blood. Yeah, that's true. That is totally true. No, Ryan. What if? What if these were the original Nephilim bloodlines that were coming and trying to open up the prisons that they were there fathers, grandpas, whatever, their ancestors were trapped in. So they came here and was using some crazy fallen angel ritual magic. We may not be far off here. We may not be. Don't don't slit your hand and put it on the rock, please. <laughs> no, we'll I'm talk we'll talk somebody else into doing it. There you go. I've already picked out a guy at work that I told him we're gonna sacrifice <laughs> him on the rock. Yeah. <laughs> Here's twenty bucks. Just go, go. Just cut your hand on that rock, just a little bit. Holy, I told him that the ancient gods needed ginger blood, and I oh, was not ginger? willing. Yeah, he's a ginger. Oh, that'll dude. work. Um, that they needed ginger blood because of the original Scots Irish white settlers and the deals that they made with them. So I wasn't willing to do it because I mean I have to be I have to be there to further this adventure. You know, yeah. I have to. I can't kill you. I mean, it's just the first step is rebuilding the bridge. And then where's the bridge go? Probably have a portal right in the middle. That's what that split is. I bet. It's not a a bridge. (gasps) It's a bridge. Oh, man. Stargate. Basically. Hey, you you know what is crazy? You said Stargate, and this is nuts. So so Steve from Holosky, right? One of the Holocult sent, they they freeze-framed. And still shotted, uh, I think it was Avengers Age of Ultron, right? When Thor comes down in the Bifrost and he lands from you know, coming from Asgard to Earth, right? So when he lands, it leaves this this runic, this this Nordic runic looking pattern that's extremely similar to our carving. I didn't even think about... Uh, I'm sorry. This is already going to be a super long episode for you guys. I apologize. Nah, we're good. We are good. 
I didn't even think about the Viking stuff. Yeah, man. I mean, they were here. I it's I know it's argued by archaeologists or whatever, but they were here. They were here way before traditional sure. European at, British people got here. Look at the Kensington Rune Stone. I 100%. Mean, I mean, there was, what is it? Literally, is it Minnesota? Because the Minnesota yeah. Vikings, they mm-hmm. literally have carvings from Vikings, and that's one of the biggest disputes. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, yeah. I didn't even think about that, just being Vikings, having fun. You know? <laughs> yeah. Literally, it was well, like a lot of these, this date. A lot of these NFL teams, dude. You like seriously, a lot of them. You got the Soft Minnesota exposure. Vikings. That's exactly what it is. You got the New York Giants. Why are they the New York Giants? Because in that area, there were all these giant skeletons found in these old mounds. So you got the New York Giants early on that were originated from there. Like you have a lot of these team names that are based on. You know, all this weird stuff that's been found throughout history. No, that's crazy. You have the Houston Texans because they're <laughs> in Texas. Yeah. See? <gasps> See? Oh, my gosh. Soft disclosure. I'm not even going to tell you why Ohio's team's called the Buckeyes. <laughs> because Buckeyes are super scary. They're also poisonous if you eat them, so that's pretty scary. That's a massive case of diarrhea. Lucky. Yo, I, we have a whole bunch. We always put them in our pockets. That's why squirrels peel off one spot of the skin to let the toxins out. Really? Yeah, you ever seen a whole bunch of Buckeyes that have like one big bite out of the side? Yep. Yeah, that's squirrels yeah. letting them ferment so they get the toxins die down. That is freaking genius. Nature is awesome. They're so that, intelligent. Yeah, isn't it? Though? It's, it's crazy. So we're going to save the the silver stuff for another episode because I've already kept you guys for a long period of time. Uh, uh, you're good, and man. I believe we you're all work good. tomorrow. <laughs> we do. We do. Uh, so if you guys are good with it, I'm just going to throw it over to you to promote the stuff one more time. Tell everybody where to find all your stuff, all the goodies. Yeah, coming soon on part two of uh, this AI Cryptos of the Corn mashup. You guys will hear about how this rediscovery of our cliff rock carving glyphs runes whatever they are how that led to a really important conversation between our co-host lance and one of his co-workers and how that led us down a journey and a rabbit hole into the lost john swift silver mine here in appalachia And you're going to find out why we believe that we have as much or more information on this lost mine than anybody who's came before us besides Swift and his partners that done it. So that's coming soon. They're the ones who knew about it. Right. That's what I meant by that. I'm glad glad you clarified that, though, Ryan. You're uh, we even have nuggets. we even have psychics involved. We do, we do. And I'm gonna tell is... you. <laughs> need to ask the mushrooms. Oh, they know everything. I mean, they. I know they do. They I just can't get them to talk time. back. I can't get they, them to talk back. You're not listening. They run everything. <sighs> Justin, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying so hard. So. We literally are redo. It's a side topic, but we're redoing the studio, and there's going to be a gigantic mushroom display right about there. Yes, uh, that's going to be awesome. We have several species yes. that are already in the mail. It's all mushrooms. Oh, nice. Just uh, remember, folks, don't lick God. Don't lick God. Yes. But tell everybody where they can find your stuff, yep. like Patreon, all that stuff. And I'll try to put links in below. I've been bad, but I will try to be good. No promises. You're all good. You're all good. Uh, even without the links, if Justin forgets it, because uh, us podcasters, we have a whole lot going on a whole lot of the time. So we forget a lot of things. We're not able to get to a lot of things. And sometimes you guys just have to give us a little bit of grace and realize and understand that you're getting a lot of free content from us. So just love us for trying really, really, really hard to give you good content. But besides that, if – He doesn't put the links in there. You can listen to it right here. You can go check us out at any major podcast platform that you listen to. Uh, You can check us out on YouTube. Even though we haven't posted anything there in about a month, 
because uh, we're a little ticked off at YouTube right now, and they're a little ticked off at us because we like to say certain things that they don't like. So we just decided, screw YouTube. But anyway, we're probably going to start putting stuff back on there because people are asking for it. And we're we're people of the people. So yeah. uh, you can check us out on YouTube at Appalachian Intelligence. You can follow us on all our socials at you know Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can go hang out with us over on the Discord. Uh, you can check us out on Patreon if you feel led to do that. Uh, Patreon.com slash Appalachian underscore intelligence. We have a lot of cool stuff over there, like we mentioned earlier. Uh, we have you know the monthly powwows that we sit down with a, a big group meeting, a big round table, and just kind of get everybody's opinions and thoughts and different stuff. Sometimes we record it, sometimes we don't. Sometimes, you know, we just we do whatever. We just have fun with it. Uh you can I think that's about it. Did I miss anything there, Ryan? No. The Discord, like we said. Yeah. We throw in bots out on Instagram sometimes. Yeah. And... yeah. Just come hang out with us. That's all we ask. Yeah. We just come hang out with us. Uh become a proud card carrying member of the Hill Folk tribe and you know, whatever you hear that you want to talk about. Oh, a major thing that I haven't even mentioned. Send us your stories. We yes. want to hear your stories. I'm really bad about send, that too. Yeah, I'm, I always forget that. I don't know why. That's the most important thing. Yeah. You can send us your experiences, your stories, your comments, your whatever, your critiques at Appalachian Intelligence at gmail.com. Uh, send us all that stuff there. Death threats. Death threats. Yeah. We've. You know, you haven't received. made it until you get two death threats a week. Right. You're correct. You're correct. Oh, We've been pretty close to that after a couple episodes, but they usually kind of die down. We've had some we just... funny reviews, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. We... They're the best. We've yeah. started a, well, I won't even get into all that. We've started a little bit of a war, and you would think, you would think this war that we started would be like on a social media platform or on the Discord or somewhere where there's a whole lot of chatting going on. No, 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 no. We have started a war somehow in our reviews. <laughs> we will get a one-star review with certain things said, and then five five-star reviews after that contradicting the one-star review and what they said. So we've started like this little war in, in the reviews. I don't know how that happens, we, but we'll take it. Whatever. We literally had one happen that like last week. Like <laughs> this review... That was heavily critiquing, borderline pretty not correct. And then the review right after it's like I don't know what the guy before me was talking about, but you know, and then all you know, it just is funny because they're fighting with each other. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty funny on my end too. But but anyway, you just come hang out, be a part of the community, come join us. You know, we love. We love Justin and Jay over here at Crips of the Corn. What they do is really, really unique. It's different than what you're going to hear on most of these paranormal podcasts or all this stuff in the weird realm. Um, so, I mean, that's why we love coming and hanging out with them because here's our thing over at Appalachian Intelligence. We love for our mindset, our thinkings, our, our beliefs, is what we experience we love for that to be broadened and expanded on a daily basis. You know, just like our good friend Joel says all the time, if your butt cheeks ain't getting tight once or twice a week, then then you're not learning. You're not do, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> and you know, maybe some of these things our butt cheeks might not be quite getting tight because you know I enjoy this stuff. But you know, like I say all the time, there's no hill that I'm going to die on. I will die on my faith in Jesus Christ. Other than that. I am totally flexible on everything else. What I believe today may totally switch up by the time I wake up in the morning based on the evidence that I'm seeing. So that's one thing that we, that we love. And that's why we love Justin and Jay so much because they, even though they poo poo on a lot of my thoughts and theories and beliefs on a lot of different <laughs> things because they start sticking to science and they, and they deliver it in a way that is so eloquent that I'm like, holy crap, they're right. They got to be right. 
Like, oh and man, it brings me down wins again. <laughs> yeah, it brings me down a notch in all my Science. in all my crazy corner stuff. But I appreciate <laughs> that. You know, I appreciate that as a you know, I may not be in the field investigating all these things, but we all all of us sitting here, we hear so many stories that you're constantly theorizing and thinking, okay, what is this? What could this be? You know, where does this connect with this? Where, what's the central figure in all of these, all this going on? So that's why we appreciate you boys. We appreciate you having us on the show. Um, you know, we, this, this tribe that, that we keep talking about growing and, and joining and being a part of, you know, I think we're, uh, you guys and us, we're, a a key part of that. We're, we're side by side in this, this tribal hierarchy, the tribal hierarchy. Well, thank you for the kind words and thank you guys for coming on again. You know how we like to end it with guests. Um, we're going to count down from three. We'll scream by into the microphones and then the outro will play. So if you guys are ready, let's rock and roll. Let's do it. Three, two, one. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to Crips of the Corn podcast. Please share with a friend you think would like us. It's the best way to help our show grow. Leave a comment, rate us, a five-star review. And remember, there is always extra content on Patreon slash Crips of the Corn.com. And don't forget, stay magical.